Any of you uh, really good at making excuses? I think that's one of my spiritual gifts, to be honest with you, along with procrastination. I came across some uh, great excuses this week for showing up late to work. I dreamed I was fired, so I didn't want to get out of bed. I was up all night arguing with God. It's a terrible excuse. Should never argue with God. A raccoon stole my work shoe off of my porch. I'm actually thinking this may have been legit. I've got a raccoon problem at my house right now. I wasn't thinking and accidentally went to my old job. That has not happened to me, I promise you. <laughs> not, hasn't happened, I don't know. I didn't have money for gas because all the pawn shops were closed. This is my favorite one. My dog dialed 911 and the police wanted to question me about what really happened. <laughs> Humanity has been making excuses for thousands of years. In fact, it started all the way back at the beginning of Genesis. In our passage tonight, Haggai chapter 1, God is going to address some people who have been making excuses for far too long, at least as God measures it. So I'd invite you to turn in your Bibles to Haggai chapter 1. I know that you've probably all got that bookmarked because that's where you're doing your devotions this week. Uh, but Haggai is the third book of the Bible from the end. Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. So you should be able to find it there. Or you can just follow along on the screen. We'll begin reading in verse 1. In the second year of Darius the king, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came by the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, the son of Shaltiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, This people says the time has not come, even the time for the house of the Lord to be rebuilt. Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies desolate? As we go through Haggai chapter 1 tonight, we're going to look at um, what it was that God was trying to say to the Israelites and also what I believe he would say to us tonight as well. So words for them and for you. First word is this, stop making excuses. Stop making excuses. Haggai was the first of the post-exilic prophets. Having not too recently, uh, or not too distantly finished our study on the book of Daniel, you guys understand what the exile is, right? That is when the nation of Israel was sent into exile. God told his people way back in the book of Deuteronomy that if they didn't live the way that he wanted them to live, if they didn't live up to their end of the covenant, that he would send them into exile. And so we know that over the course of several centuries, the people became more and more rebellious toward God, and so he did what he said he would do, and he sent them into exile in Babylon. So after they had been, excuse me, after they'd been in exile for 70 years, God allowed them to return to the land of Israel. That's kind of where Daniel ends, is at the end of that 70 years. And so they go back to the land of Israel, back to Jerusalem, and Haggai was the first prophet who came and spoke to them after the exile, after they had returned. And so his message was very important to the people. So I want you to notice uh, in verse 2, God refers to them as this people. Thus says the Lord of hosts, this people says. That's kind of like using your child's middle name when you get angry with them. Right? Allie knows she's in trouble when we say Alethea Joy. You know what I'm saying? Um, it might also be comparable to when your spouse talks to you about your children. It's always my sweet little Allie unless she's in trouble and then it's your daughter. You know what I'm saying? That's how they felt uh, when they heard this people. They knew at that point that they were in a bit of trouble. When things were going well, God referred to them as my people. But at this point, God is not referring to them as my people. He's referring to them as this people. You see what's going on here? 
Uh, the hair on the back of their necks probably stood up at this point. Also notice that the people are not saying that the temple should not be rebuilt. They're just saying that the temple shouldn't be rebuilt yet. Now is not the time. So this is the attitude that Haggai is addressing uh, when he brings his message to the people. See, when they first returned from Babylon, one of the very first things that they did is they laid the foundation for the temple. They got right to work to rebuild. You remember Nebuchadnezzar had come and stolen all of the artifacts out of the temple. He had pretty much laid it completely flat. And so they come back and they start rebuilding. They rebuild the foundation. Everything is great. They had reinstated the, the sacrificial system that Moses had told them uh, to perform. The progress was really encouraging, but it was also very short-lived. The reason for that is, or the reasons, I guess, are numerous. First, um, when Nebuchadnezzar came in, you remember he deported a number of people to Babylon. He also imported a number of non-Israelites into Israel. And so the Jewish people who were left behind when the rest went with Daniel and his buddies to Babylon started intermarrying with the people that Nebuchadnezzar had imported. And they had children. Those children were called Samaritans. That might be a familiar term to you. This is where the intermarrying of Jews and Gentiles started or really ramped up, I guess, would be a better way to say it. So the Samaritans wanted to identify themselves with the Jewish people by helping with the reconstruction of the temple. But the Jewish leaders refused to compromise and allow them to help with the reconstruction because they had done what God forbid them to do and intermarried with the pagan nations around them and they adopted all of the pagan religious practices of these nations surrounding Israel that Nebuchadnezzar had brought in. And so they weren't worshiping God. They weren't following God. They had rebelled against God and his covenant. And so the, the Israelites who came back wouldn't allow them to help with the temple. And it created all kinds of political unrest. All kinds of pressure was brought on them. And they just refused to buckle. So added to this, we'll read in a couple of verses that they were having all kinds of economic problems as well as these political problems. And we know based on the date that is listed at the beginning of the chapter that it was harvest time. And so they're incredibly busy and you almost start to feel a little bit sorry for them. Um, I'm sure many of us can relate to what it feels like to have the pressure to compromise your convictions in order to keep peace with the world around you. Anyone feel that tension at times to compromise just to keep the peace? Um, and we understand financial pressures, right? We understand how hard it is to be so busy that you don't know if you're coming or going. But before you feel too sorry for them, let me remind you of verse 4, right? Um, let me go back and show you verse 4. Is it time for you to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies desolate? In spite of all of these setbacks, they had plenty of time and plenty of money to build homes that were quite comfortable. That's the implication of the fact that they weren't just homes, they were paneled homes. They were filled with wood and ornate artwork and so forth. So they had plenty of time to make their homes really nice, but the house of God was laying in ruins. So, verse 5 uh, begins, Now therefore thus says the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. You have sown much, but harvest little. You eat, but there's not enough to be satisfied. You drink, but there is not enough to become drunk. You put on clothing, but no one is warm enough. And he who earns, earns wages to put into a purse with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. So you may have noticed as we were reading through that, that verses 5 and 7 are basically identical. This is a literary device known as framing. It's used to set off this little section or set apart this little section uh, from the rest of the chapter. 
The word consider, uh, consider your ways in verses 5 and 7 is literally translated set your heart. It's based on the Hebrew word levav. That little bit of information is completely worthless to you. I just like saying the word levav. It sounds like a French word, doesn't it? Levav. Right? And whatever, it doesn't matter. Now, the, that's the word for heart in Hebrew. I love you with all of my levav. Some of you guys will use that later. It'll score. All right? The word for heart is occasionally used in the Bible of your literal heart muscle, but most of the time, normally, it is figurative. It is used to cover every aspect of the inner man, your emotions, your thoughts, and your will. The heart is the seat of every emotion, from joy to grief, from love to anger, from tranquility to envy, from excitement to disappointment. The heart is also the origin of thought, right? We talk about thought taking place in the mind. They did not separate thought from the heart. Emotions come from the heart. Thought originates in the heart. So understanding and wisdom and knowledge are all attributed to Levav. The heart is also the seat of the will. It's where our intentions are weighed. It's where we make our decisions. So in Hebrew, the heart represents the whole man. It encompasses every aspect of human personality. And so when Haggai tells the people twice to consider your ways, to set your heart on your ways, it is not meant to just be a passing thought. Hey, you guys ought to think about this. No, this was a careful consideration a careful analysis that permeated everything they felt, everything they thought, everything that they chose to do. He wants them to consider. And what he wants them to consider is found in verse 6. I want you to look at verse 6 while I read some different verses from another passage. Just follow along. You shall bring out much seed to the field, but you will gather in little, for the locust will consume it. You shall plant and cultivate vineyards, but you will neither drink of the wine nor gather the grapes, for the worm will devour them. Because you did not serve the Lord your God with joy and a glad heart for the abundance of all things, therefore you shall serve your enemies, whom the Lord will send against you in hunger, in thirst, in nakedness and in the lack of all things, and he will put an iron yoke on your neck until he has destroyed you. Did you notice how closely what I read parallels what you had on the screen there in verse 6? What I read came from Deuteronomy chapter 28. It is a passage that they should have known. It should have been very familiar to them. And what Haggai is saying by using these words, he's pointing them right back to Deuteronomy, you should have known. God told you that if you do not do the things you're supposed to do, he's going to make life incredibly hard for you. You just came back from the exile. You know that God does what he says he will do. This shouldn't have been a surprise. He's doing just what he said he would do, even if you don't recognize it for what it is. You are getting just what you deserve. I wonder how often we have disobeyed the clear teaching of Scripture, and then sat back and wondered, why is all of this bad stuff happening in my life? Now, I don't want to say that every bad thing that happens in our life is because we have sinned, right? We don't, we don't believe in Christian karma, right? But there are consequences to our actions, and sometimes God does discipline us when we are disobedient to his word, right? We understand that. Maybe we would do well to read the Bible once in a while and figure out what it is that God expects from us, what God wants us to do so that we can avoid getting ourselves into trouble. It's remarkable how much trouble we can avoid when we simply do things the way God tells us we ought to do them, right? It sounds so simple when I say it. Fortunately, in verse 8, he tells them how to remedy the situation. Go up to the mountains, 
Bring wood and rebuild the temple that I may be pleased with it and be glorified, says the Lord. Just a simple thing, do what God tells you to do. Up to this point, the chapter has kind of been building in tension. And verse 8 is the climax of this rising conflict. In fact, the whole structure of Haggai chapter 1 points directly to verse 8. Um, let me explain this. I won't go into too much detail because I probably care a whole lot more than you do. But when we write in English, we write in paragraphs. Right? Typically, it, with a paragraph, you have a topic sentence, and then all of the other sentences in the paragraph somehow expand on or relate to the topic sentence, work it out in some way. Right? That's just normal English writing grammar kind of stuff. Well, in Hebrew and later in Greek, they had a different uh, structure that they used called a chiastic structure. It's named for the Greek letter chi, which is like our letter X. Right? So it's named that because what is on the top mirrors what is on the bottom. So let me show you an example that's easy to see. Isaiah chapter 6 verse 10 says, Render the hearts of this people insensitive, their ears dull and their eyes dim. Otherwise they may see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and return and be healed. So you see it goes hearts, eye, or, or, sorry, hearts, ears, eyes, eyes, ears, hearts, right? Just in reverse. That's a very simple chiastic structure. And these are found all over your Old Testament and quite often in the New Testament. So Haggai chapter 1 is a giant chiastic structure, much more complicated than this. And we won't spend a whole lot of time on it, but let me just point out that if you were to read verse 1 and go read verse 15, the dates are listed. It's two different dates, but they're listed in reverse order. Verses two, or 1 and 2, God speaks. These people says, in verses 13 and 14, God speaks again. Verses 3 and 4, God asks, is it time? Verse 12, the people answer, it is time. Verses 5 through 7, God is not blessing. Look, consider your ways. Verses 9 through 11, God is not blessing because all pointing us to verse 8, go up, bring wood, and build the house. Isn't that fun? The only reason I bring that up is because verse 8, I'm going to go back and show you verse 8 one more time. Verse 8 does not seem like it ought to be the climax of this chapter. They've just come back from Babylon this is the first time that God has spoken to them since they have returned, and the message is, go get some wood? That, I mean, that just doesn't feel like the climax of anything. That feels like an incidental detail to me. You expect something about the greatness of God and his majesty and how he's reestablishing his covenant, and I will be your God and you will be my people. That, doesn't that feel like the first message ought to be? No, the first message is, go up to the mountain and get some wood and rebuild the temple. That's the first message. Do what God tells you to do. Oh, I'm going to go back to verse 8 again, one more time. I just like what it says there at the end. He tells them why they should do it, that I may be pleased with it and I may be glorified, says the Lord. This is a far cry from this people in verse 2. God is showing them the way that he will be pleased with them and that they can glorify him. How long do you think it had been since the people of God had known that, that God was actually pleased with them? More than 70 years, right? It's been... Eh, most of these people have probably not been alive to hear God say... Well done. Right? And here it is. You want to make God happy? Go get some wood. <laughs> Just go up, take your axe, cut down some trees, bring it down and rebuild the temple. I think that that is a very hope-giving kind of a message. So, all right, let's move on to verses 9 through 11. You look for much, but behold, it comes to little. When you bring it home, I blow it away. Why, declares the Lord of hosts? Because of my house, which lies desolate, while each of you runs to his own house. 
Therefore, because of you, the sky has withheld its dew and the earth has withheld its produce. I called for a drought on the land, on the mountains, on the grain, on the new wine, on the oil, on what the ground produces, on men, on cattle, and on all the labor of your hands. So consider yourselves warned. As we've seen, these verses are similar to what we read in verses 5 through 7. In this section, God explains not only what is happening, but why it's happening. He's judging the people because his house is desolate. Because his house is desolate, he sends a drought. It's really a cool play on words. The Hebrew word for desolate and the Hebrew word for drought come from the same root word. So in essence, he's saying, because my house is desolate, I have desolated everything that you do. There's another literary device in this section that I find interesting. It's called polysyndeton. Isn't that awesome? It's a 50 cent word that means many ands. I called for a drought on the land and on the mountains and on the grain and on the new wine and on the oil, and on what the ground produces, and on men, and on cattle, and on all the labor of your hands. We don't translate it that way because that's not how we talk in English, right? We just put a bunch of commas in and then put an and at the end. There's an and with each. Can't you almost feel the weight piling up on their shoulders and they're weighed down more and more and more with everything that God is desolating because they're not doing what he's asked them to do. Everything that they touch turns to dust. And so at this point, they have a decision to make. Are they going to continue disobeying God or are they going to head for the forest? Often when the prophets spoke, people turned a deaf ear. You know this from reading and hearing stories from the Old Testament. But by God's grace, that, that did not happen this time. Look at what happens beginning in verse 12. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shaltiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet as the Lord their God had sent him. And the people showed reverence for the Lord. Then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke by the commission of the Lord to the people, saying, I am with you, declares the Lord. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Shaltiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, on the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year of Darius the king. Thank you, I forgot. So here's the word for them and for you. Woohoo! <laughs> right? For the first time in this chapter, we read that something really good happens. The people listen to the voice of their God and they go and they build the temple. Right? So they've answered the question of verse 2 Is it time for you to live in your paneled houses while my house lies desolate? And the answer is a resounding, no, it's not time for your house to be desolate. It's time for us to do something about it. So they get to work and they rebuild it. By the way, it, it took 24 days. Now, I don't know how many of you have ever undertaken a building project, but to gather all of the supplies and make all of the architectural drawings and all of that, for that to happen in 24 days is pretty remarkable, right? You can't pull permits in 24 days, I don't think, right? Um, they probably didn't have to pull any permits. That, that was just an aside. The greatest statement, I think, is found in verse 12, that the people showed reverence for God. Literally, they feared God. So suddenly, all of the distractions, all of the excuses, the, the Samaritans trying to force their way in, the resources that are somehow lacking because there's been a drought, and in an agricultural society, a drought means you haven't any money, right? The fact that, that all of these pressures, all of these problems just melt away 
because now their focus is on pleasing God. And as a result, we know that God is pleased and he is glorified. So as we turn our attention for a few minutes to application, this is not a Bible passage telling us to build bigger and better church buildings. So the next time one of us gets up and tries to preach Haggai 1, you know, to kick off our big building project, it just fire us, because this has nothing to do with building buildings. Amen. Right? <laughs> Here's, here, there's one demand. There, there's one command, one demand that is placed on us from this passage, and that is, stop making excuses and do what's right. Stop making excuses. Just do what I asked you to do. In their case, go cut down some trees. It seems simple, doesn't it? It seems very mundane. Stop making excuses and do what I've asked you to do. At the beginning of the sermon, we, we talked about the fact that we're all really good at making excuses. Right? We all have excuses for why we don't read the Bible. Right? We just don't have time. It's really complicated. I don't always understand it. We've got all kinds of excuses, right? The truth is, we have all been given 24 hours every single day to spend however we will. Stop making excuses. You've got the same amount of time that everyone else in this room has. Stop making excuses and read your Bible. Are there things more important in your life than hearing from God? That's really heavy-handed, isn't it? You can probably just cut that out of the video, Brian. We don't want to leave that in there, make people feel bad. Let's move on. This is, this is getting heavy. Prayer. Who has time to sit? That's hard. Oh, wait, we've all got the same amount of time again. Let's move on. Who's your one? We've been talking for four weeks. This is week five. Have you been praying for your one? Last week we handed out some invitations for you to give to your friend, your neighbor, your coworker. Vanna is holding them up in the back. Thank you, Vanna. Who have you invited? Oh, wait, did you have an excuse for why you couldn't invite somebody this week to come to our tailgate party next week? It's a tailgate party. Hamburgers and hot dogs. Why do you even need an excuse? Am I right? How many people did you invite? Stop making excuses. And do what's right. Service. We all have a reason why we can't serve God. We're all busy. Oh, shoot, 24 hours again. Stop making excuses and do what's right. Fellowship. You know, getting to know people so that you can help meet their needs when the time arises. Joining a life group, small group, whatever we call them this week, right? You can fix that in the video too, Brian. <laughs> Who has time to take out another two hours of their week for fellowship? Am I right? Yeah, stop making excuses. Do what's right. Baptism. Sometimes we put off doing the simple, basic things that God has asked us to do, like, you know, identifying before the entire community that we are followers of Jesus publicly stating, I follow Jesus. We have excuses. Ah, I don't like getting my hair wet. <laughs> Tithing. Would you agree that so far the list has been just the basic things that we're supposed to be doing as followers of Jesus? I haven't put hard stuff up. 
right? This is the basic stuff. Tithing actually goes on the list of really basic stuff, right? Why, why haven't we done this? Stop making excuses. Do what's right. Forgiveness. We all have that person that we know we're supposed to forgive. Or maybe we're the person that needs to go and ask for forgiveness. And we've been putting it off. Am I right? Stop making excuses. Do what's right. Confronting sin. <sighs> now we're getting a little harder. You know that as followers of Jesus Christ, we're to help our brothers and sisters who are trapped in sin and to help them get out of it. But it's messy and it's hard. And there's certainly somebody more qualified than me to do it. And I'm the pastor and those are my excuses. I don't know what you guys do, you know? We gotta stop making excuses and jump in to the deep water and do what's right. Perhaps it's forsaking sin. We all have the sin that we know we're supposed to forsake and that we haven't yet. And we've got all kinds of reasons. And they're just excuses. So stop making excuses and do what's right. We ought to follow the example of the Israelites here. You don't hear that a lot in sermons, do you? Do what the Israelites did. Forsake your excuses. Stop making excuses. Repent. Literally turn around. Fear God. In so doing, you will please him. Do you ever sit and wonder sometimes, what do I have to do to make him happy? It's really not that hard. There's a list of starting places. I can assume, like that's a top 10 list, right? Of areas where we should stop making excuses. I'm making an assumption that I stepped on everyone's toes tonight. If I didn't, come and talk to me, I'll give you the next 10 on the list, right? Because we're prone to this excuse making for coming up with reasons why we can't do what God has called us to do. Tonight, let's, let's follow the example of the nation of Israel and stop making excuses and start looking to glorify God fearing him, wanting to please him more than we care about what the world around us thinks of what we're doing. Let's make him happy. I think in doing so, we will find that our world is a much better place in which we live. Amen? Let's close in prayer. Father, we are a people prone to making excuses for why we disobey what you have asked us to do. And tonight I would ask for your forgiveness. I would ask your forgiveness for the poor example that I have set. I would ask your forgiveness for our church that we have not done all of the things that you have called us to do. And Father, I pray that tonight will be a night where we covenant with one another and before you that we will no longer make excuses for not doing the right thing, but rather that we will wholeheartedly live in a way that brings you honor and glory. And Father, as we have one week before our Who's Your One tailgate party, I pray that that would be the first place where we would stop making excuses and that we would invite our friends, our neighbors, our co-workers, our family members who do not know you to just come and, and, and have a party with us. We might get to share the gospel with them and, and just show them the joy that we have in serving Jesus. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.